Well, Emma Donahue, I don't know how I even begin to uh, introduce such a talent. If I told you everything on Emma's bio, we probably wouldn't have time for the interview. So suffice to say that Emma was born in Dublin in 1969 and now calls London home. Her most recent work and her second book for younger readers, The Lottery's More or Less, Here's what it looks like when you, if you want to go downstairs and buy it and get it signed tonight. It's a sequel to The Lotteries Plus One, which was described by the New York Times as delightful, warm, and funny. And it made the best of the year's list of Publishers Weekly and the Irish Times. Her most recent novel for adults, The Wonder, about a fasting girl, and we'll hear all about that, in 1850s Ireland, was shortlisted for Ireland's Kerry Group Novel of the Year, as well as the Giller Prize, and she's currently adapting it for the screen. Her novel, Room, I'm sure all of you know about, uh, that best-selling book was shortlisted for the Man Booker and Orange Prizes, and has sold more than two million copies. Two million plus a few thousand more tonight, I think, Emma. Um, the feature film based on Room was nominated for four Academy Awards, Best Adapted Screenplay by Emma Donahue, Best Director, Best Picture, and Best Actress, which was won by Brie Larson. Emma is also adapting her novel Frog Music, a literary mystery inspired by a murder in 1870s San Francisco. That's being developed into a feature film. She's written five other novels, five short story collections, three works of literary history, and two anthologies that span the 17th to, to the 20th centuries. That's the short bio. Please join me in welcoming Emma Donahue. I think I'll stick with this one. Let's see if mine works. Oh, excellent. Otherwise, we've got an extra for you over there. So you're adapting frog music to a film. You know, um, it, it's very odd. The film business is a hard one to break into. It's not like other forms of writing. It's very, it's like trying to become a spy or something. You know, you have to wait for them to come to you. You can't go knocking on the door and saying, let me be a spy. So um, like many writers, I found that the film doors seemed closed to me. But then um, because of Room going so well, you know, little Irish Canadian film filmed in Toronto goes all the way to the Oscars. So suddenly I got lots of opportunities and the door kept swinging open. So Yes, I'm involved in a number of um, film projects, and a couple of them are adapting my own books, and a couple are adapting um, other people's books. I'm adapting a Sarah Waters novel, for instance. Such a treat to climb inside a Sarah Waters plot and figure out how all the gleaming cogs click together, you know? And it's a very different use of your skills writing screenplays versus writing novels. That's true. I think writing um, for film and TV is great as long as you realize that you have no power at all. Um, you, are, you are a hired writer, you, you are doing piecework, you're doing each individual draft, and even if you kid yourself at the time, you know, as you finish the draft, you think, I wrote something here. But then, um, you know, it's just one of an infinite number of drafts. They don't even tell you in advance how often they will ask you to rewrite it. And as to whether all the money comes together so that the thing finally gets filmed, who knows? So, so you have way less power, but it's very sociable, and they do, you know, lunches. And um, if you're lucky <laughs> enough for the film to actually get made, there are things called red carpets, which don't come up in many of a book writer's life. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> so it's way more glamorous, but you're, you know, you're a marginal figure, whereas in fiction, it's all less glamorous, but you're the queen bee. So <laughs> pros and cons. But with Room, you were actually there on the set. Yes, I used to go up on the Greyhound, um, and I'd, I'd go more or less humbly knock on the door of the film studio in, uh, near Cherry Beach. I remember the first day, I, um, I didn't know how to get into the studio without disrupting something. I thought they might be filming a key scene, so I just froze outside the door until some intern said, there's a light, you know, it goes red when they're filming. <laughs> And even on the last day, you know, I had visited the set quite often and I was beginning to feel, oh, yes, I'm in this business. And then as I turn up outside the, you know, the psychopath's house in Scarborough where we're filming the final scenes, um, one of the sort of bodyguard people stopped me and said, you can't come this way, they're filming a movie. So, you know, there are many ways to feel on the outside of a busy film set, but it was always fascinating. 
But you don't have to fill the page with words. You can let the film breathe a little bit. Um, it's funny. Yes, you, you shouldn't fixate on the dialogue because, first of all, they'll cut a lot of it. <laughs> so there's no point you're writing the perfect line or even the perfect scene. It may get cut for reasons of weather or budget. Um, so you shouldn't obsess over any one line in your script. You just try and give the whole script as much of the right the right feel of the story as you can, yeah. Because that film felt very natural, and often I think movies don't live up to the book, but in this case, it was a great movie, and uh, I mean, a lot of that had to do with you writing the screenplay for it. But um, you, uh, the way you wrote it and adapted it for the screen, you allowed the actors to, to be natural and to have natural dialogue so that we, the audience, felt that we were viewing a mother and son just in their everyday world. Yes, and you know, to be honest, we, we got Jake Tremblay to, to um, sort of ad lib a lot of his dialogue. It was based on my dialogue, but, but with a child that young, you know, he was seven when we hired him. And so you don't want to say to him, say the comma right, young man, you know. It's much better to, to get him chatting along the lines of. So quite often our director was lying down in the bathtub, so to be below the sight level, or sometimes he was in under the floorboards, speaking out through a little hole in the floorboards, because there was nowhere for him to hide in that room. Um, so, so quite often he was there, you know, in the wardrobe or, or in the bath, sort of talking the child through it, you know, getting him to come up with something which would sound very natural, because as you say, we just absolutely had to believe in that mother and that child. But what's it like for a writer um, working on a, a film with your script. I mean, you have to let go to a certain extent, don't you? Absolutely. But the air of extreme competence and professionalism in common between everyone on that set made me feel, oh, you know, it's in safe hands here. I remember um, noticing that on the set, the, the um, designers had drawn in like little faces around the electrical outputs the way a child would. Mm -hmm. You know, the costume designer told me how she had a sort of character arc for each person in it. She said to me, like the child at first will be in nasty sweatshirts that his captor will buy in Walmart. And then he'll be in, you know, plush things that his grandmother has bought for him on his release, but then he'll be in the clothes he actually likes at the end. And I thought, okay, everyone here is putting such thought into everything, I don't need to try and control it anymore. Um, you use your own children as, as inspiration for your books. I and sometimes feel bad how much I do that, yeah. Um, I don't think I've published anything in the last 15 years that doesn't owe something to them. Um, in the case of writing for children, I, I harvest lines and ideas and accidents and episodes from them. Um, my son once made me pay for a joke, but apart from that, I just take <laughs> everything for free. <laughs> And um, I, 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 I take their advice on things. My daughter and I are currently arguing about what should happen in the, in the fourth of the lottery's books. I'm hoping she'll change her mind by the time we get to it. But um, yeah, they take real ownership over my work. And my son is dead proud of pointing to, you know, room which has a notoriously sick premise and saying, I inspired that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, his teachers must be giving you calls, wondering how that <laughs> happened. But, you know, maybe while we're on that subject, we could talk about the fact that, that there was a lot of hope in that book, and there's hope in, in most of your writing. Very much. Um, I, I think sometimes just the, the one-line version, when I tell people what my, what my books are about, they can sound rather sick. But, yeah, I'm, I'm nearly always trying to find some kind of human warmth at the heart of it. Or rather, I wouldn't write a book about an 11-year-old who's not eating unless I was planning to give you some kind of reward for putting in the time, you know? Um, in a way, it's a kind of a contract for me. Um, not that I have a very set group of fans the way, say, a, a murder mystery writer might have, but even if it's different fans for each book, I feel, you know, come with me on this journey, but I'm not going to put you through all that misery for nothing, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I, feel, I feel responsible to my readers to, to kind of weigh up how much pain they can take and how much anxiety, you know? Well, you, you've just talked about or mentioned uh, writing about an 11-year-old girl who's fasting in Ireland. So this is the subject of the wonder. That's right. And that, that book was sort of anti-inspired by my daughter, meaning I used to look at her sitting there, you know, tucking into sandwiches and pasta. And I would think, okay, she's brimming with health and a natural, normal greed, and she always wants as much food as her brother. And I thought, by contrast, 
I was sort of conjuring up in my mind, what if you had a child of equal capacity and intelligence and energy, but growing up in the rather stunting atmosphere of post-famine Irish Catholicism, you know? What might it do to a child like that if she was always rewarded for not eating, for being a good girl, for, for doing without? You know, whereas if you grow up in, in London, Ontario today, you know, you're pretty much encouraged to sort of, you know, enjoy all you can in life. But if you were in a very different setting, you might take all that same intelligence and, and wit and decide to devote it to being so good that you didn't eat. And, but let's talk about how you came up with this idea in the first place. It's actually There were a number real of real fasting girl cases. I mean, not huge numbers. I suppose writers are nearly always choosing cases that are statistically anomalous. Um, but often they represent, they, they show something really true about our lives too. For instance, you know, in, in the case of room, I wasn't seriously trying to do a commentary on the lives of children who are raised in locked rooms. Um, it's more that I was trying to illuminate something about just everyday motherhood in London, Ontario, or anywhere, but through putting um, motherhood in the weird spotlight of a kidnap situation. And similarly with The Wonder, um, you know, I'm, I'm writing about I would say I found about 50 cases, all told, of people who claim to live without food. So from about um, 16th century Europe, um, some in North America. There was a famous one in Brooklyn. Um, so they're very rare cases, but I think they're really interesting because often they, they show up what our society was not quite saying. You know, messages like, you know, the more feminine you are, the less you will eat, that kind of thing. So these, these rare cases can really make that very literal, like, look how good I am, I don't need food. And you've mentioned before, I think, that Ireland is often defined by the, the Great Famine. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, um, I mean, I could have set a book about fasting anywhere. But first of all, if you're going to um, kind of attack a culture or religion, it's more honest to do it about your own religion, you know? <laughs> so I thought, you know, Irish Catholicism is where I'm from. So, so I'm going to set the story there. And also, even, even in the version of Irish Catholicism that I grew up with, there was a lot about, you know, um, if you have, a, you know, a sty on your eye or something, you should offer that up, you know, as if it would be a little treat for Jesus. Like, oh, Emma's in pain, marvelous. You know, so this, this, this weird strain of the ascetic and the, the slightly masochistic, frankly, a lot of those 19th century um, prayers, you know, all about wash me in the blood of Jesus. There's a strange relish. There's a kind of a sensuality turned inside out there. So as I say, it seemed fairer to do that about my own home culture rather than about somebody else's. So then the wonder is rooted in, in historical fact, but you take it to a, a different space entirely. Um, the uh, young girl, Anna O'Donnell, she's 11, um, and she's seriously ill. Um, I think, in, I think in the contemporary themes always show up in your historical fiction. They're not separate. Um, so, of course, I was inspired by, you know, a, a friend I know whose daughter was anorexic. Um, I'm inspired by the things I read as well. So, so for me, there's no clear distinction between historical and contemporary fiction um, in that, you know, whatever's going through your mind today will, of course, show up. Um, when you're writing a story set back then. And I don't think that's anachronistic. I think that's the, just the writer is always going to bring um, what's on their mind to the project. And similarly, um, something set in the near future, like The Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood has famous talked, famously talked about how she got everything in there from some moment in women's history. She, she, she limited herself to the terrible things that have been done to women, in fact, in the past. So for me, that, that line between um, the past and the present and the future has never been very clear. I just like to harvest interesting stuff from, from wherever my imagination goes. But, but when you, you zoom into the psyche of this young girl, you can see how today kids can be radicalized, and there is some relevance. And that's right, yes. I thought not just about kids with eating disorders, but about, you know, zealous teenagers getting into online groups and then going off to, to fight jihad. And there seems so many parallels. When you take the pure idealism and, and fervor and, frankly, ignorance and naivety of teenagers, you know. <coughs> Would you like some water? Oh, you've got some. Okay. Um, you, you talk briefly about the lotteries um, and how your own kids have been inspiration. But the lottery is like, it's like a family. fantasy version of my life because um, I've ended up with two kids, but I'm from a family of eight, so two feels a little bit shr shrunken to me. Um, so I thought I would just write about what would feel like a normal family to me, you know, eight kids. And my publisher said, that's a ridiculous number of children. <laughs> that couldn't be. Even though, you know, there are four parents involved, so I thought eight kids is not that many for four parents. <coughs> 
So my publishers tried to bargain me down to five children, and I didn't think that counted as a big family at all. So we, we agreed. I killed off one character. Um, got us down to seven, though my son will never forgive me because I happened to kill off the 11-year-old boy, and he was an 11-year-old boy at the time. Um, but the character I killed off was an introvert, and I'm sorry, introverts just don't always quite earn their place in the story, you know? <coughs> but this is a family whose philosophy is why not? Indeed, indeed. Um, they're, they're a family who... Um, they, they live in Toronto in, in a kind of a park tale with ravines, and they are homeschooling all their kids because the premise of my story is that, um, you know, these two men and two women had a baby together, but then they win the lottery by accident. They pick up a ticket off the floor of the maternity ward, and then and they decide to have lots more kids and homeschool them all. Um, so it's, it's the life that I imagine on, in my more deluded moments that I would have liked to live, you know, everything big. <laughs> Whereas, in fact, I'm more than happy sending my kids off on the school bus so I can get my books written. <laughs> <laughs> but I like imagining, you know, the lotteries do things like, um, you know, plunge into Lake Ontario to fundraise for penguins at New Year. Um, in the next book, they're going to climb the CN Tower. All these things I will never get around to doing myself. But you, you, you also deal with issues like dementia. The grandfather has dementia. Yeah, I, I think of um, the, the, the Grumps character in the first book, um, their grandfather has to move in with them because he set his house on fire. He left the, the deep fryer on. Um, which is like the leading cause of house fires, apparently. And this, this character, in a way, was my mother's gift to me because she had the early stages of dementia at the time, and I was even able to talk to her and say, like, can I use that? And she's, oh, she was all for my using things. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I decided to take something very painful to me, which was gradually losing my mother from dementia, and, you know, see, could I use it? And also, see, could I find reasons to, to research it and think about it that weren't always making me sad. So it just gives you a little distance on a painful subject if you're going to use it in your books. Um, and I, I feel my mother would have thoroughly approved as she was f such a fervent reader, you know? So, yeah. So you normalize situations. And this is one of the reasons you wrote this book, because somebody challenged you. <clears throat> Oh, yeah, that's right. A friend um, uh, was serving us a lovely New Year's meal, a friend in Toronto, and she said to me, you know, your kids have two mothers and my kids have two mothers. Why can't you write a book about a family where they have two mothers and it's just normal? And I said to her, well, I'm sorry, if it's just normal, that doesn't make for a very entertaining story. So, in fact, I took her idea and I ran the other way with it. I thought, how abnormal can I make them? I'll give them two fathers as well, and they'll be homeschooling, and they'll be millionaires, and yet they're going through their neighbor's garbage because they are so eco-friendly, they like to reuse every little object. Um, so I, I thought it would be great fun to make a family who really normality is the last thing on their mind and then to give it a slightly utopian big family feel because I grew up on all that Victorian children's fiction, people like E. Nesbitt and Noel Stratfield and so on. And I liked the idea that you take this alternative family who are all multicultural um, but actually give it a very kind of old-fashioned cozy vibe. Because I don't think, I, I hate that moment in children's books when they introduce some heavy issue and everything grinds to a halt while an adult explains, you know? And I thought, okay, I just refuse to do that. I'm going to make it blithe and breezy, even about issues like, say, the youngest child in the book, Oak, he's quite delayed because somebody shook him before the lotteries adopted him. But I don't have any moment where things grind to a halt and they talk about disability. I'm just, you know, just as the family wants to include him in all their fun, I want to do the same thing in literary terms. I refuse to think of either the old man with dementia or the, the, the baby with a delay as people who sort of kill the vibe in the fiction. I, you know, I think humor can, can help with almost every subject. But so many of your books are inclusive with all your characters. I think to, back to Slammerkin uh, as well. You, you like your characters as a reader. You identify with them, even though they, they, they might be an outlier. You know, um, my novel, Slammerkin, which was my first historical novel way back in 2000 here, that really taught me something because I didn't think anybody would like it in that the girl is a very bad-tempered, selfish girl who makes consistently poor choices, and it doesn't end well. So uh, it was very hard to sell that novel, and um, one publisher turned me down on the basis that their, their readers prefer rags-to-riches stories, not rags-to-more-rags. <laughs> and um, my publishers at the time, it's funny, friends often think once you're published, you're somehow safe, like it's a civil service job. Not at all. 
I was with Penguin and HarperCollins at the time, and they dumped me. They both dumped me. Um, and so I thought the book was going to ruin my career, and then it sold better than anything of mine had till that point. So I thought, first of all, publishers don't know. They have no idea what's going to sell. So you should just write what you like. But I also realized that readers out there are more than capable of making that emotional leap and strongly connecting with a 18th century Welsh servant girl who makes bad choices, you know? So you should never underestimate underestimate readers by thinking that what they want is relatable, easy subject matter. Yeah, I, I find that it's kind of condescending when a writer uh, doesn't want to take me into something interesting the way your characters are, are in these situations like Slammerkin. You, you want your, write, your uh, reader to struggle a bit when they're reading. Yeah, and um, you, you want them to, to, to come to like a character in spite of themselves, mm -hmm. because of the magic that fiction works. I mean, basically, if you write something from the point of view of a villain, you know, we don't think of them as a villain. We think of them as, as us. Point of view has a hugely powerful psychological effect. So if you can work that magic, um, you don't want to make it too easy for yourself by starting with somebody likable. You know? But yet in Room, you made old Nick, <clears throat> the villain, quite dull. Yes, I deliberately did nothing to, to bond my reader to old Nick, yeah. In fact, I wanted to take all the glamour out of him because I'm really sick of that trope of the fascinating serial killer with his you know, meticulous preparations and his uh, you know, intriguing room hidden behind a wall. So I even gave old Nick really dull decor. You know, when the police finally go through his house, there's like a stairmaster and a massage chair. You know, I, I, I almost made fun of how banal this man's evil was. I tried to think of him as just your kind of standard wife beater or, you know, Nazi camp guard. Like just, you know, guys who think they own weaker people, basically. I tried to give him that form of evil rather than the kind of exoticized sexual evil because so often our stories end up making the killer or the rapist seem like a fascinating character and the girls are so anonymous. So I just wanted to reverse that and, and keep, keep the, the kidnapper so much in the shadows. Yes, you know? thank you for changing that. <laughs> Obviously, many people agree here. Um, uh, I, I read somewhere that... Uh, that you think it's good as a writer, as a writer, to be promiscuous, and that is to cheat on yourself as a writer. Do you want to explain that? Well, okay, it makes me sound <laughs> bad, right? Can I, can I just say that Chris and I are celebrating a quarter of a century this year, right? So, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, maybe if my private life had been more wildly outrageous <laughs> and zigzag, I wouldn't need to do this in my fiction so much, but you know, <laughs> living in a fairly sedate city, so I need, I need excitement mentally. So yes, I cheat on my own books. It's true. Um, at the moment, I have two deadlines with film companies. <clears throat> and the next thing I'm meant to be doing is a rewrite of a novel that I've already sold. What am I working on? A brand new novel. Can't tell anyone about it. So you know, I'm writing to the film companies going, oh yeah, busy working away on your draft. <laughs> and I'm sneaking off to Weldon and researching something else. <laughs> <coughs> well, well, you write in the back of cars, you write while your kids are at tennis lessons, you write where your kids are in the room with you. And kids it's, sometimes resent that, like um, at ice skating, when they look up, you know, from a fall perhaps, <laughs> and they see my head still down <laughs> over the laptop. Um, I feel I definitely look worse than all the other parents who are, you know, cheering yes. their kids on, you know. But, but so you're always writing something, a short story in the wings, <coughs> uh, a film. I write in parked cars, though sometimes the sunlight does slightly bother me, but um, yeah. And I particularly like signing my kids up for long lessons. I mean, there's a tennis lesson at Western. It's an hour and a half every Sunday afternoon just when I'm craving some work time. It's perfect. <coughs> Do you feel, looking forward to, to your life in 10 years, 20 years from now, that there will be an endless combination of words for you? Are there many more words to explore? Oh, yes, I hope to die in the traces, you know, like, like Boxer the horse, yeah. Um, I, sometimes when I'm on an airplane, a small airplane, you know, coming in from Toronto or something, and it's wobbly, I know those planes are not actually more likely to kill you, but it feels like they are. Yes. And so I find myself thinking, oh, no, but I've got five more books to write. I can't die yet. So, yes, I just hope this keeps going, yeah. And films, television, Indeed, plays. indeed, and... Um, yeah, probably genres I haven't tried yet, because that's the real way to make yourself feel stimulated, is the sheer fear of, you know, writing in a form you've never done before and afraid you'll make a fool of yourself. Yeah. Well, Emma, it's been a pleasure to talk Thank to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Emma Donahue.
We have a present for you. Do you want to hold this up and show it to the audience? This is our first annual words award for a writer who has made a significant contribution to the landscape of words across Canada and also a significant contribution in your own community because despite the fact that you have this international career, you do interviews all over the world, you work all over the world, uh, I hear podcasts with you all over the world. You managed to find time to stay involved in the community of London. I meant to ask you, do we claim you as our own or does Dublin still claim you? Oh, you can claim me. Yeah, yeah, you can claim me. And just so you know, this work of art was done by Ian Greasley, who's here somewhere. Ian, can you wave? Oh, there he is. He's way back there. He's a, an artist from London, and these are um, letters from the London Free Press. These are original block letters from the London Free Press, and he's put them together to say words. And we're very proud that you are our first recipient. It's very special. Very metaphorical, given what you do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emma. It's been a pleasure.